Good evening. I'm Curtis Gilbert. I am a correspondent with APM Reports. We're the investigative and documentary journalism unit at American Public Media. APM is the national arm of Minnesota Public Radio, and that's where I used to cover city government, um, and uh, particularly in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, now, as a reporter, there were some uh, words that I would not allow myself to use on the air. And I'm not talking about the ones banned by the FCC. Uh, no, these words are far, far worse because they would result in the thunderous echo of radios being turned off all over the state. And I'm about to say them now, so brace yourselves. The words are tax increment financing. And I usually avoid them in favor of a more descriptive uh, phrase, which you'll hear me use a lot tonight, which is property tax subsidies. But tonight we're going to spend a whole hour talking about TIF because it's important. As a state, at last report, we spent more than $200 million a year in property tax money on TIF. Um, and that means that instead of spending that money on police or fixing the roads or um, any of the other things that uh, local governments do in the state, education, uh, we spent it on subsidies for private development. Now that money transformed blighted properties into shiny new buildings uh, and it created affordable housing which probably wouldn't be financially viable uh, otherwise. Uh, but you know, there are trade-offs here and that's what we're really going to talk about tonight. Uh, we're having this discussion here in St. Paul uh, because this city continues to use uh, property tax subsidies such as tax increment financing uh, in a lot more than its neighbor uh, just to the west Minneapolis which has been uh, actively weaning itself off of TIF. And so we're going to talk about whether that's a good thing. Our sponsor is St. Paul Strong. It's a nonpartisan uh, citizen organization that pushes for essentially transparency in city government here in St. Paul. And they put together a panel of very distinguished speakers that I'm going to introduce to you now, um, beginning with Ann Rest, who's a DFL state senator from New Hope, and she's also the vice chair of the Senate Tax Committee. Uh, next to her, we have John Manillo. Uh, he has decades of experience in real estate as a developer and a broker, uh, and he also has led a number of civic organizations here in St. Paul, including the District 17 Community Council, Scenic Minnesota, and the Friends of Mirrors Park. We have Jay Kudrowski, who is a senior fellow at the U of M's Humphrey School for Public Affairs. Uh, he's worked in public finance both at the state and city government level, uh, and also, he's also worked extensively in the private sector at Wells Fargo. And finally, Lee Kruger, who is the president of the St. Paul Port Authority, which uh, for those of you who don't know, is a city, one of the city's economic development arms. Uh, Lee has a background in commercial real estate uh, and also degrees in planning and public affairs. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. And I warned Jay about this ahead of time, uh, that he should be prepared uh, for this. Uh, so Mr. Kudrowski, if you could begin uh, without getting too deep into the weeds, uh, could you describe in the simplest possible terms, what is tax increment financing and how does it work? Tax increment financing is a municipal uh, fiscal tool that allows a city to purchase land or construct public improvements to foster new economic development. The public costs are paid for over time by the additional property taxes that are generated by the new development above the original property taxes. Hence the name tax increment, it's the increment of property taxes above the original amount that pays for the public improvements. Now, Jay, I'm sure I wouldn't uh, qualify for this, but is this sort of like if, if I were to say, gosh, my house would be worth a whole lot more if I redid the kitchen. I know that'll jack up my property taxes. So what I'd like is, is a loan from the government. And rather than those additional property taxes going into the uh, city coffers, they would then go, they would instead go to pay, pay down the loan on my kitchen renovation. Is that a, is that a good or a bad analogy? Not perfect. <laughs> okay. Uh, the tax increment, uh, the tool has to be used for uh, land purchase or public improvement. So it has to be something public mm. that the dollars are actually used for. Um, there's a little bit of a misconception that the dollars go to the private enterprise or the new economic development. It's that possibly that the land is written down to be able to offer it at an economic price, uh, 
so that the development can occur, but the development dollars don't actually go to um, the private party. Got it. Okay, so it sounds like it should be a win-win. Um, the community gets some economic development that wouldn't happen otherwise. Uh, the developer uh, gets to uh, you know, direct some of those taxes towards the, the project in a way or towards public uh, things related to the project. Um, and the government uh, still gets the property taxes it was getting before, right? So it's only the increment that goes to the uh, financing. John, ben John Manello, what's the problem here? Uh, okay, um, first of all, I wanna say that um, it is not a loan because it's never paid back. It's money that um, really disappears. Uh, the taxpayers have to pay for the burden that that development creates. You know, <clears throat> um, I've heard uh, many mayors uh, uh, spin the uh, goals of the city as, uh, as having more activity and vitality. Uh, we have better jobs, they say, and uh, better housing. Uh, we've been called America's most livable city. Um, and I would say um, <clears throat> that what we really have is more development. But all development isn't good development. Uh, density is not necessarily good development. The uh, uh, TIF is a program everybody likes, it seems. Uh, uh, unions like it, certainly elected officials do, uh, developers do, Chamber of Commerce does, the newspaper does. Uh, <clears throat> so there's no critic of TIF until you have to pay for it. And people don't realize how expensive it is. And we spend in St. Paul in ex excess of $20 million a year paying debt service for what Jay has described as being land buy-downs, but really what it is is it's saving developers money so they can use it in other ways. <clears throat> so uh, if we have a, um, uh, if we have a development, uh, uh, if we force development by subsidizing it uh, without a market, what does that do to ourselves? If we don't have an adequate market to fill the space, all of a sudden, we're creating more space, more burden for services, uh, and, our, and where are these people coming to fill it? It's usually coming from <clears throat> Minneapolis, Bloomington, or even from one ward to another. So we are actually competing with ourselves in doing that. And we find that, that developers who use this uh, TIF financing development tool often even leave the state. And I can give you some examples, some, uh, uh, some poster uh, child examples of that, and I will do that. But um, my, I'm a critic of, of abuse of TIF, although I can say that on paper, originally, how it was drawn up, it makes some sense. But we quickly went beyond that with lack of discipline. So. Thanks, John Manila. Um, Lee Kruger, uh, as president of the St. Paul Port Authority, um, you're in the position of uh, kind of evaluating projects and looking at what kinds of subsidies might be needed to spur development. How do you decide when to use a property tax subsidy like TIF for a project? Well, I think for us, uh, Excuse me. We, um, I would say a lot of it does become project driven for us. Um, I'll use a specific project. We're not using TIF on the uh, Midway Stadium site. I think a lot of you know that the uh, Port Authority has entered into a joint venture to develop a project where the Saints used to play. And here's a classic example why we think, you know, some kind of government help would work. We have a land value of approximately $3 million on that site, but it's about a $5 million cleanup project. Sorry. Closer? It to you. All right. They're usually with microphones. Okay, thank you. Um, but so in that sense, we would look at it and say the private sector is not going to pay $3 million to buy this land and then pay $5 million to clean it up to have a value when it's done of $3 million. And, you know, 
whether I'm kind of butchering the math or not, it's an $8 million commitment to get a $3 million project. What tends to happen on sites like that with the contamination and the soil conditions, it doesn't get built. So it's our position that that's a good site, the market does want it, but they don't want it at $8 million. Um, it's not worth $8 million, it's worth three. So what we'll, we'll use is we will do what we can to try to make that project viable for the marketplace. So I agree with what John's saying, is if you're creating a market that doesn't exist, but in this case, there is a, a market that would exist in that site. It's a high demand site, but not at $8 million. So in that sense, what our role will be is to make it viable for the marketplace at a fair price. And, but you said that's not a, a project that used TIF? No, but What's it's- an example of a, one that the Port Authority's done that used TIF and you think made sense to use it? Uh, the one that I've been spending way more time on than I should is the downtown Macy's project. Right. So um, that's a, what I would say is a classic example of of where TIF can be used to create a project that one would not exist without it. When the Port Authority purchased that project, and um, we closed it in January of 2014, Ramsey County had it on, on their books as worth $4 million. They had the land worth $3.999 million, and the building was worth $1,000. That was their estimated market value. We had $1.4 million in asbestos abatement to take care of, so in effect, you had a building with a negative value. And again, the marketplace is not gonna really step in and, and try to reuse that building with all of the problems that it had. Um, it also was about a $13 million demolition project. So when you put in the acquisition price of three million plus a 13 to $14 million demo project, you're in on a $17 million project before you even start to build. So what, the, what we're trying to do is use TIF to, to create the um, enough of a assistance to the development to make it viable. In this case, um, the timing is great that you asked that question. We just got a revised assessed value from the county yesterday. Uh, it came in at about $25 million when our project was done and stabilized. Unfortunately, it's gonna cost $60 million to get it to be worth 25. Um, so in that sense, to create, to help bridge that gap, TIF is definitely a tool that can be used on that one. And again, um, if we didn't do it, I would kind of want to point out to, as we want to evaluate projects, what if we didn't do it? And I think some of the potential outcomes in that project would be such that we just didn't find them to be acceptable for, for the city. Uh, John Manello, uh, Macy's Building, good use of TIF? Uh, I, I don't relish uh, the position of the Port Authority in that deal. Uh, uh, it's a symptom of the problem that TIF has created. If we can't, um, uh, a downtown piece of property, a block, is worth, as uh, Lee has said, about $4 million. And if you're gonna have to put $16 million into it to get it shovel ready to sell for $4 million, it doesn't make sense. Well, why is downtown so, uh, devalued, <clears throat> and I would suggest the reason is, uh, well, let me give you an example. Uh, the poster child I've talked about would be Lawson Software, but there are other examples. Lawson Software is a building, uh, is a, uh, a company that we went to Minneapolis and took uh, that company out of a tax-paying building and put them in downtown St. Paul. Uh, the, um, uh, we, we did it with a deal that was not public, <clears throat> that it would be sold a year after completed to a contract developer for a fixed amount of money. <clears throat> uh, four years later, he turned around and sold the building for a $34 million profit. So where did that money go? So it's not paying taxes. We're not collecting taxes. It's the money's going to pay the bonds off which is gone to a company, which by the way, from Atlanta, Georgia, so it left Minnesota completely those dollars. Uh, and here's the real kicker, is, is that it dumped a whole lot of space on the market that to this day has never been filled. And not only that building, but all of downtown. We went from a 5% vacancy in the late 90s 
to a high 20% vacancy, and we still haven't recovered that. In fact, we're still close to 20%, and the only reason it's that low is because we've started taking buildings off the market and turning them into residential buildings. So uh, we've forced our valuations down on the entire downtown because of vacancies. Uh, and in most downtowns, which you have a commercial market driven by their downtown, in St. Paul, it's the opposite. And so who is left to pay for those expenses and those services? It's the homeowners and the small building owners. Uh, Jake Kudrowski, uh, Senator Rest, I want to get to you in just a second, but Jake Kudrowski, I just want to make sure, because you corrected a part of my a, a subtle problem with my understanding of Tiffin, so I want to, before I launch into this next question, make sure I understand this right. Who gets to decide to authorize a TIF district? Uh, it would be a city, so it would be the city council and the mayor. Uh, however, that arrangement is uh, by charter constructed, uh, and they would decide. Uh, and that's, in a sense, one of the problems with tax increment financing because not only are city taxes affected, but the school taxes, the county taxes, and the property taxes that go to the Metropolitan Council are taken as part of that increment and used for the development. Um, and the state equalizes property tax for school aids, so in a sense, the state is subsidizing to some extent the tax increment. For, for the schools, but not for those other units of uh, government? Well, for counties, there's also some equalization as it relates to uh, human services. Um, and uh, so there is some effect there, um, but it's primarily schools that uh, have the greatest uh, uh, impact. Uh, Senator Rest, you're the uh, you're on the Senate Tax Committee. Why is it set up like that, where the a city can sort of authorize something that affects all these other local governments that don't really have a say? general ed levy, um, the state ceased to have to provide um, the uh, making up the difference between the loss of uh, taxes to the school district. So when we don't have that, then the, the, uh, the school district is not, uh, it's not only not losing tax base, the state is not having to provide a subsidy. I'm not going to repeat that. No, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. So, but, so are, is what you're saying then uh, there's no harm to the other governments because of this reform? It, it used to be that um, when, a, when a city made the uh, a tax increment financing decision, and keeping in mind that there are uh, there are uh, stages or there are, different, there are different tax increment financing laws depending on when the tax increment financing decision is made. Uh, the pre we always talk about the pre-79 districts which are uh, t TIF in perpetuity. They go on and on and on forever. Um, and then in, um, uh, in 82, we had uh, some reform for how TIF, the TIF decision could be made. And perhaps the biggest reform was done in, uh, in 1990, 1991, where when a city decided to make the, de the decision or an economic development authority, they can make a TIF decision as well, um, they had to give up some of their LGA, their local government aid, um, that would balance what the state had previously been having us subsidize the, um, the school districts. So they really had to make a much harder decision. Uh, it probably wouldn't surprise you that uh, cities came and asked for um, special circumstances in creating tax increment financing districts, and the very first thing they wanted waived was the LGA penalty. Um, in 2000, again, um, under, or 2001, when, um, uh, Governor Ventura's administration 
we formed uh, the the uh, uh, reform the way in which we um, uh, imposed taxes, uh, property taxes for um, for the schools, and got rid of the general ed levy, which is inching its way back some 15 years later, by the way, with a proviso that it may not be used um, to, um, uh, to claim a subsidy from the state for lost tax base at, at the school district. Um, but I think that you know, one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is that the tax increment financing laws have gone through uh, phases. In, um, in the, when we had the, the, uh, the big recession, for example, uh, the tax increment financing decisions were really, really loosened up. We allowed pooling, which was which lets you take money from one place and spend it someplace else, is, is the most general definition of it, and uh, which we had not allowed before. And in some periods, we didn't allow any pooling at all, and in some periods, it was unlimited pooling. So uh, when we talk about TIF and the pluses and minuses and the um, the burden um, versus the, the the benefit. It's really important in my mind as a legislator to understand uh, at what period the TIF decision was uh, was being made in order to evaluate um, its success in the long term for not only the citizens of any given community, whether it's St. Paul or whether it's a suburb or whether it's um, um, on the Iron Range or wherever it is. Um, but also to look at uh, what the benefits have been, keeping in mind that the most important and crucial decision that has to be made with honesty, transparency, and integrity is the but-for decision. That is, but for, given this subsidy of whatever kind, the project would not go forward. The but-for decision is the most important decision that's made. And um, without being too cynical, often it's winked at. It's like, oh, yeah, but-for, and, and uh, all of a sudden the project is, um, is approved because it really is a responsibility of the economic development arm or the city it, itself. And um, we've tried to toughen that up on occasion, um, but... It really has not uh, been all that successful to do it because the city gets to make the decision. And uh, there's that difference between, I think, responsibility and accountability. And uh, they're responsible for it. And then the taxpayers have to hold them accountable for the decision that they, um, that they make. And uh, TIF is different from era to era to era, de depending on the uh, the economic situation at the time, recalling that it began as a way of correcting urban blight. It wasn't meant to build a McDonald's out on the edge of town or to build a gas station on the edge of town. Or, and I'm sure you can come up with the same similar uh, things about St. Paul. Like yeah, okay, or the Mall of America. <laughs> you know, a little farmhouse that they decided was a blighted property. A blighted property. It was the most valuable property, commercial property, in the whole country. But the tax increment but for test was winked at and we have the Mall of America. Not that there isn't anything, you know, anything the matter with the Mall of America as an investment, but the way it was done um, was certainly a, um, uh, an abuse of, um, of the tax increment financing uh, decision-making process. And yet, um, the legislature allowed it to happen. Um, there was no a suit filed that overturned that but for decision. And we have uh, the Mall of America. We have Bloomington right now skimming um, for um, some of the uh, fiscal disparities money in order to, um, uh, to improve what's going on in, in the city itself. Um, you probably can tell I'm pretty passionate about tax increment finances. <laughs> uh, uh, there, there's a lot in there and I wanna maybe try to um, 
try to unpack that. You mentioned uh, it, TIF being used for uh, McDonald's on the edge of town. Is that something that's happening? Well, within tax increment financing, there, there, there are five or six different categories of, um, of uh, findings that would determine what kind of a tax increment financing uh, district you have. They mentioned the, the uh, Midway, um, and they didn't use TIF, but there's contaminated soil there. So there, there are things called soils districts where the, the but-for test is met because uh, you, can't build, um, uh, you can't build something on contaminated soil. Um, or a housing project, so there are housing districts. The very first kind was redevelopment districts. That's where the finding was that it's blighted, that there's some standard housing, or substandard, not housing, but some standard uh, buildings on the property that is going to be redeveloped. And it had to be a certain percentage, and, um, uh, and that analysis had to be uh, done. So first of all, it was to correct blight in the 70s uh, and in the urban core. Later on, you could do tax increment on bare ground. No blight, not anything. Just that um, there would be some sort of economic benefit that would bring jobs, you mentioned jobs, that would bring jobs to a particular city. And uh, a town here didn't use a TIF, Five miles down the road in another town, in another city, they used a, a tax increment. Uh, if you were going to build a McDonald's, where would you go? Well, you're going to go to the city that gives you the economic um, benefit. You're going to go where the subsidy is because that is a rational economic decision to make. Uh, John, you want to jump in? Could I uh, ask, uh, add to that, uh, uh, the Ford plant, which is the most valuable site in the upper Midwest uh, that we've announced before any development that we're going to offer TIF on it. Uh, if we have to offer TIF on the most valuable property, what don't we have to offer TIF on? Um, I, I, and here's the other kicker on that, is by announcing it while Ford still owns the property, it makes it more valuable for them to sell, and that money leaves the state. So. To me, uh, using TIF as a tool in the wrong way hurts us. And, and by announcing up front that we are open for TIF on a project, every project that comes to us is going to require TIF, because that's the way it's going to be structured, for two reasons. One is because it's free money, and the other reason is because that, that developer has to compete with other developments that already have TIF. So it's a race to the bottom. Now, we are at the bottom right now uh, when we have to <clears throat> put parking meters on Grand Avenue to raise $400,000 a year because we can't afford it anyway else. Or the LGA, which we couldn't uh, get the bonding bill passed. We lost $3 million temporarily, it looks like. <clears throat> and, and we're, we're going to cut nine policemen, seven firefighters, rec, rec centers, hours, library hours because of $3 million when we're spending well over $20 million on TIF bonds a year. So <clears throat> I'd like to have a discussion a little bit later about uh, what do we do? And that's really where we're going to have to have to focus. So. Lee, uh, yeah, I would love you to jump in, especially on the Ford site thing. If I'm not mistaken, if I, I don't believe TIF has been offered on the Ford site, I believe there's a three-year period from when the blight finding was that they have to figure out whether to offer that. And I think what the city just did was ask for an extension of that period. And I think just to keep the options open, I, I, I can't speak for the city, but I don't believe TIF has been offered for it. I believe the ex it was asked for an extension to make sure that it didn't expire. That, that may be correct, but soil. yeah, uh, mm -hmm. but it was in the bonding bill. Yeah, um, which didn't pass. What? Hasn't passed yet. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, so, uh, does the yeah, so? Uh, but explain why the city would even want to try to keep hold open the option of uh, property tax subsidy like TIF on a site that you know. Uh, I think um, the mayor has said before uh, that developers are salivating over it. So what, why would we need to subsidize something like that at all? Well, what's I think what Senator Rest just said. I think uh, they're trying to find out what's in the ground. I, I think okay. uh, it is uh, could it very well be some significant contamination that's going to 
to scare people off. Again, it comes down to the point of uh, what level is Ford cleaning it to? I believe they're going to go a little bit beyond industrial standards, but for somebody who's going to want to develop it and for a housing project, that next increment of cleanup may be, you know, pre prevent them from taking that step and, and doing the residential project. And I think there's some really um, preferable sites to be developed in there. The developer has to decide, are they going to take that next step and, and change it from what the current um, cleanup requirement that Ford is cleaning it towards. Mm -hmm. have, have we figured, the city, the city oh, go ahead. Has the cost of roads and sidewalks and water and sewer, and they need to figure out how to finance that, and tax increment is an attractive alternative to finance those public improvements. The alternative is a developer would in fact put in the sidewalks and the, the streets and the sewer and water as they do in suburban developments, but that's more costly for the developer, so obviously the developer is gonna prefer the tax increment approach. But St. Paul needs to weigh those two alternatives as they consider what they wanna do with the site. Uh, do we know, is the site, I, I, I've heard conflicting things about how, how contaminated it is and that there's maybe a dump area that that was really contaminated, but maybe there's other places that are maybe already at residential standards, or is it all terribly um, polluted? Lee, do you know? I can't speak to that. Okay, I'm not involved yeah. in that one. Okay, just curious. Yeah. It's closed yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, I guess a, a question that I wanted each of you to respond to um, that we've been kind of dancing around, which is if you could change one thing about the way that tax increment financing works right now in Minnesota, uh, what would you change? Uh, Senator Rest, um, <laughs> since you would have a, a say in such a thing, I'll start with you. One of the things that I, that I have uh, tried this before and I uh, found it to be a daunting task is to um, recodify the tax increment financing statutes. Right now, the, the term, for example, excess increment, that is the, ta the taxes that are collected on that particular project um, bring in more money because of the increase in the value, which we all like, um, that's necessary to, uh, to uh, pay off the, um, the bonds. And, but that word, excess increment, is used differently in different parts, uh, different meanings in different parts of the, of the statutes. And so whenever we've tried to um, have a recodification, uh, all kinds of red flags go up because of the statutes under which a TIF decision was made at one time, uh, the city feeling like, well, if you change it to mean something else, then we can't use it the way we have been using it because our tax increment decision was made in, in 90 rather than in, in 2005. And um, I don't know if so much if it's a change um, as such, but I, it, it's really too bad that we can't have a, um, um, a, a lexicon that everyone can depend upon uh, when they are making a tax increment. If any city is, can depend upon when they're making a tax increment uh, financing a decision. But it, it, has, um, it has been daunting and we've tried it a couple of times and it is, um, it, um, uh, it's been a fruitless endeavor. However, I do think that we need to make sure when we allow um, special tax increment financing districts that we're quite clear about what set of definitions are going to be, um, be enforced uh, uh, for cities that are asking for exceptions to the TIF law. And, um, and that happens more often than uh, not, and including the um, I don't know if the St. Paul Port, Port Authority has asked for uh, exceptions to the TIF law, but um, they're, um, they're pretty common when a city comes in and says, um, well, we want to create a tax increment financing district. However, we don't want to have to go, we don't, have, we don't want to have to adhere 
to any of the tax increment financing statutes. We don't want to have to um, uh, make some progress on building within five years. No, we don't like that rule. We want 10 years or, um, and on and on and on and on. And um, I, I wish that we could have a, a, the strength of a tax increment financing law that we would not have cities coming in and, um, and asking for every single year, by the way, every single year coming in and trying to justify the case that um, they should be excused from some of the major provisions of the tax increment financing statutes. John Manillo, uh, what's number one on your list for reforms? <coughs> well, you know, it's, it's the, the way we always deal with TIF is on a current project, and there's always projections, these rosy projections on what it's going to do. And, and it's, nobody has a crystal ball, so it's really difficult uh, to, uh, to analyze uh, and predict that. However, we have 40 years of experience now, uh, and what we, we can do is go back and look at what we have done and then evaluate it. And so <clears throat> I've asked the city, um, just would you tell me how much we uh, recover uh, in TIF to pay bonds annually, as opposed to, <clears throat> um, uh, well, what we pay and, and, and what we recover. So we can see if it's a plus or minus, and go back each year to see how we do. <clears throat> and the city, what they've done, and I've had about 40 other questions for them, and, and what they'll do is they give me this report, about 200 pages, <clears throat> and say, here's the answers to that. And so I defy anybody uh, to, to go through this and really give you an answer, including the city. So I asked them, would you show me where that is? And they can't, either they don't want to or they aren't able to, tell me those answers. <clears throat> but I can tell you, if you look at downtown where most of our TIF dollars in St. Paul has gone, it's $152 million that was reported, um, downtown has a dead zone right in the core. Well, what has TIF done for downtown? It's created that dead zone. Uh, uh, we'll go to the other extreme, and I don't want to condone the politics in Lake Elmo, but Lake Elmo has never offered any uh, subsidy to anybody, and they have a waiting list of developers. And the reason is, is because of the, uh, there's a market there now. So we are killing our market by overbuilding and subsidizing to do that. Uh, I mean, don't developers kind of always look for that green field on the edge of town and they don't want to deal with any of these old polluted sites here in There's the center city? The developer will develop. Uh, that's what they do. Huh. Uh, so, and they always think they can do it better than someone else. So you're never going to be at a loss for developers. Uh, the question is, is are we at a loss of subsidies? Uh, Jay Kudrowski, what would you change about the way TIF works? The, the problem that I've observed over time is that uh, it's an unlimited tool, that cities aren't constrained as to how much they can put into a tax increment. Uh, I think if you were to simply limit the amount that they could put into tax increment, for instance, 15% of the tax base, no more than 15% could be in tax increment financing districts. I think that would go a long way to sharpening the pencils of city officials in giving the next tax increment district because they would then be compete having competition between various developers for that next tax increment uh, dollar. Uh, right now in the city of St. Paul, uh, it's 18% of the tax base is in tax increment financing districts. Yeah, that high. And somebody said that uh, Minneapolis, I think you mentioned Minneapolis isn't using the tool as much. Maybe not recently, but I checked this afternoon. Uh, they're also at 18% of their tax bases in tax increment financing districts. Seems to me that that's just too much. So um, I, I pick a number 15%. Uh, it would then force uh, the city officials to, uh, to allocate um, a valuable uh, subsidy. Lee, is that, uh, how did we get to a point in St. Paul and apparently Minneapolis too where we're so much of our tax base is tied up in these TIF districts? 
Well, I'm under the impression that St. Paul's targets 10%. Yeah, I'd heard too. Everything that we do when we work with the city on projects, we're always using 10% as the as the cap. And I believe St. Paul's been fairly disciplined at um, holding us accountable when we come up and uh, if if we show a project that that pushes it above that, um, it it doesn't go very well for for that request. As for answering your question on that one, I'm not as well versed in the law as everyone else here, but I think what you guys are doing tonight is pretty positive. I think we're all gonna, there's gonna be a number of us who are gonna have different opinions on this thing, but I think we're able to talk about it and maybe agree on some things and not agree on everything else. Um, and, I, and I've known John for a while, and I think you know John and I have, have not necessarily always seen eye to eye, but I think we've been able to have these pretty fair discussions. And I think what John said was right, that if there's a market for something, developers are going to do it. And I would say that that's you know, where I would maybe come with a different conclusion than John is that I think that's why downtown is having a little bit of a dead zone is I think the market's not quite there. And I think this is, we want that downtown to be vibrant. And I think St. Paul's done some incredible steps in recent years to create the vibrancy that it wasn't, you know, experiencing a half dozen years ago. Um, but I do think sometimes the catalyst is, uh, is um, positive. I think the city really um, took a risk and was successful in the pen field. I think they're gonna make some money on that one. And I think that was a catalyst for some other projects too. Other people might disagree, but the good news is is that, you know, I think they close in a month or so. Um, I think that's a positive project for the city. And did, was that a TIF project? I believe there was Penfield some, yes. was too, okay. Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing a map of downtown St. Paul TIF districts and the major, or more than half of downtown St. Paul is is covered in TIF, isn't it, Lee? Something like that. I can't answer. Uh, okay. I don't know that. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I, there was I, it was in the districts in the city, 53, and that's not including projects which are in the districts. So um, it's in the Penfield. While it was a timing issue where it actually made money because it's, there was a demand for housing, but what did they do? Is what they should have done is taken the excess uh, increment and paid down our our debt. But they started another district with it. And so it just continues to grow all the time. We have 30, over 30% 30 of our city without TIF is off the tax rolls. And when you add TIF onto it, and, and the reason there's a discrepancy with 10% uh, uh, or 18% is this report. Because if you read it, uh, in one page, they have two, two terms. Uh, one is uh, total captured value and total increment to TIF authority. Now, what's the difference? So I called and asked them. Uh, yeah, I asked the city what the difference was, and didn't have an, they didn't have a good answer. They just said different people use different terms. Well, that's a point I was making. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's really no way of following this and accounting for it. And, but we do know that we struggle every year to pay for necessary services, essential services. And when that happens, our TIF uh, is too high. Now, so, oh, did you want to jump in? I'm sorry, I thought someone. Um, uh, well, well, I would just like to um, uh, emphasize that the uniqueness of um, St. Paul, because it has so much um, tax exempt property, uh, government property, that it. Um, it has a um, uh, it has a skewed um, um, rationale for the for an analyzing TIF as opposed to um, other cities. Maybe not uh, obviously not as big as um, St. Paul, but that doesn't have that greater percentage of um, of tax exempt property to start with, and. Um, I feel like I have been um, pretty critical of tax income financing, but actually I'm a supporter of it. I do think it is one of the few tools that, um, that cities and economic development authorities have to encourage uh, development in their, uh, within their, their city boundaries. And what we just want them to do is use it uh, judiciously. We have tried to have a, um, uh, a uh, percentage of, of, of property um, tax value um, limit and uh, have been unable to 
garnered the support uh, of legislators who naturally are, are responding to the um, uh, to their constituencies and the cities in, in their districts. And so we've never really been able to do that. Um, but we do warn them that when you get to a project where you're 30% of your tax base, and that has happened across Minnesota, has been uh, captured in tax increment, um, things have gone awry. And uh, small cities in particular, I think, need to be really careful that they have sophisticated analysis of their economic situation before they make a, um, before they make a, a TIF decision. I do think it's been valuable in, um, in housing, uh, in housing districts. I uh, am, am supported them. I have myself um, uh, sponsored some special legislation on occasion if I thought it was warranted in, uh, uh, in some, some part of a TIF district that's in my own, uh, my own five cities. So um, there's a you know, 30,000 foot level and then there's the building down the street. <laughs> and um, part of the legislative uh, balance is to decide uh, when um, the building down the street, even if it doesn't fit nicely into um, a, uh, uh, a policy perspective is, is more important. Um, the other thing that it confounds, by the way, that in in the metropolitan area is the whole program of fiscal disparities. Um, those two programs are in, in a sense, in direct conflict with one another. Tax increment says, um, come to our city, we'll give you a subsidy, let's build our tax base. Fiscal disparity says, oh, wait a minute, we're going to the whole idea is to share tax base so that there is a leveling of economic prosperity within uh, commercial industrial property. There, there is a fierce tension between those two um, fiscal policies that govern economic development in the metropolitan area. Outside of it, not so much. Um, and I really don't count the range too much, although there's fiscal disparities on the range. Um, and it only applies to commercial industrial property. It doesn't, com it doesn't apply to um, fiscal disparities, uh, doesn't take the increase um, in, um, in value um, from the housing districts. It takes it from commercial industrial property. So those two programs um, have never really fit well together. And that's another thing that we have to constantly be aware of when we are making a proposing or considering changes in uh, tax increment financing. Because of course, since it began, we have never been successful in uh, making um, uh, reforms in, in uh, fiscal disparities. And of course, uh, St. Paul has, I believe, continued to be a net receiver in um, in enjoying the um, uh, the fruits of of um, sharing commercial industrial uh, uh, property values. Yeah, it's the number one, I think, beneficiary of fiscal disparities. Isn't that right? Or um, so uh, let's see. We have about ten minutes left. I just kind of wanted to give you the ten ten minute warning uh, here. Um, I, I was just doing a little research uh, last night to see well what have the trends been around tax increment financing statewide, and uh, I was interested to find in the state auditor's annual report that it has been uh, on the decline. The number of districts has been ticking down, and the amount of property tax revenue flowing to those districts is down. Um, Senator Rust, what do you attribute that to? I think in part there was an appetite for um, tax increment financing in the, um, in the late 70s and throughout the 80s, and then we had some major reform in, in the 90s, and um, the, um, the appetite for forming uh, tax increment districts uh, uh, leveled off and went down, and then there, it's been kind of cyclical uh, during the, the Great Recession. Uh, 
work was not able to be done on many uh, projects, and so they were either set aside or they would come to the legislature and ask for an extension, and we actually did that on a statewide level. Um, and uh, contrary to some people's expectations, TIF is not perpetual. It does have a life. <laughs> And, one, and uh, there are 25-year districts, that's a long time, but sometimes that's what's needed. Um, there are uh, eight-year districts when it's bare ground and it's just a project that's going to increase jobs. Not very much of that in St. Paul, but in, in, uh, in greater Minnesota there, there is, um, is some of that. And so cities have taken the responsibility to um, you mentioned the excess increment. They have d taken on the responsibility to pay off the bonds and decertify the districts, have them come back on um, the tax rolls. And that, um, th they're to be congratulated on that. That's the way that tax increment is supposed to work, not get a 12-year district or an eight-year district and come back in year seven and say, well, we can't make it go unless you give us 10 more years um, to uh, collect increment and to, um, uh, before we certify, uh, uh, decertify uh, the district. So I, I do think that cities are to be congratulated for uh, being more conservative in, in certifying districts and in being more diligent in, in, um, uh, in paying them um, paying them off and decertifying and going back on the tax rolls. Now, we're here in St. Paul, and is often the case in uh, discussions in St. Paul, the city of Minneapolis sort of looms uh, in the background. And as we've uh, made mention of throughout this discussion, uh, Minneapolis, uh, starting under the R.T. Ryback administration, did try to, and they used TIF on one big project during his time, but uh, tried to really rein it in, be much more conservative about when they use it. Uh, they try to use it for affordable housing and not much else these days. Lee Kruger, um, why can't St. Paul sort of do the same thing, kind of, um, you know, pull back on this tool? Why would that be a mistake? Well, I think a lot of it still comes back to what's the project that you're trying to achieve. Um, I'll use a couple examples. I mean, the Ford site's been brought up earlier. We were, in the Port Authority did a little consulting with Ramsey County up on the TCAP site up in Arden Hills. And one thing I think that we, we do have to remember is that on some of the projects or, or the end users that might end up locating at Ford or in Arden Hills are being competed with you know, Austin, Texas, Orlando, Florida, and stuff like that. And I think when people talk a little bit about ab abuses on it, we're not trying to pull stuff away from Egan, but I think the Ford site has the ability to be one of those dynamic sites that's going to be competing with Austin, Texas, and um, Silicon Valley and stuff like that. Not everyone may believe that, but some people really do. And I think I, I just believe that you don't put away the t tools that are in your toolbox until you know what you're going to try to build. Um, whether or not there's been abuses on it, I think everyone here knows that, uh, you know, Senator Ress has mentioned the recession in 2008. I think a lot of people would agree that there was some problems with residential mortgages, but we still take out mortgages today. Um, so it doesn't mean that you just don't do it anymore. You, you use it uh, accountability-wise and transparent, all the things that were mentioned earlier. But I just think for TIF, you just don't put it away if you need it to use as a tool when we realize who we are competing with. And we're not saying in St. Paul that we're trying to pull projects away from Minneapolis, but we are dealing oftentimes with projects that are looking at Orlando and, and Texas. Um, you brought up the word transparency, and uh, we're getting close to the end of our discussion, but I just wanted to kind of throw the question out for each of you, which is, do you think that the public uh, understands what tax increment financing is, and if not, and I think we know the answer is in general not, uh, what could the government do to make this process more transparent? Lee, do you have any ideas about that? Well, I said earlier what you guys are doing today is pretty neat. I think, you know, to have these kind of, of forms where people can come up and, and talk, I'm sure that, they, they said there's a Q&A for a little while afterwards. Um, I'm, I think 
allowing people on this panel and others to, to answer questions and, and just come out, you know, ask the questions and hold us accountable for that. Jake Kodrowski. Uh, back in the uh, late 70s, I was part of uh, a municipal finance commission in Minneapolis. And it brought together um, some very talented business people, uh, academics, um, citizens, uh, government officials, uh, and they came together to try to understand the whole financial picture. And I think we need more of that rather than saying, oh, I'm not gonna go for any more taxes or, or this is a bad project or that's a bad, I think we need more of a comprehensive view of what's going on. And I think that would really help the city of St. Paul um, have a game plan, a financial game plan as to where they're heading and what can they afford in tax increment and what can't they afford. Uh, John Manello, what would you do to increase transparency? Well, uh, I'm disappointed that uh, we invited uh, city staff and, and a number of elected officials who didn't come tonight. Um, and I don't know if they feel they know everything that has to be uh, said about it or not, but we asked the city uh, for a forum, uh, a tax policy forum to, to put on by the city, and it didn't happen. Uh, so we did it uh, at St. Paul Strong. The uh, uh, I think um, every whenever a TIF project is done, there's a report by a consultant. Uh, I'd like to see that. I'd like those reports to be public. Uh, I, no. <laughs> There's a lot of things that aren't public about these things, um, but we have, we have not, uh, uh, I, and I can't get a straight answer, frankly, from uh, our debt manager on what, why certain things are the way they are. Uh, okay. uh, I, I just want to give Senator Rest uh, okay. a chance to answer the question because we're almost out of time. More transparency. Well, I, I um uh, would agree that having more public discussions about the policy um, and what its goals are, what its justifications are, is um, perhaps more important than the minutia of, um, of the statutes. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that's the transparency that we need um, for, the, uh, for the general public. Um, the understanding of, from that 30,000 foot level is what we should be aiming for, the city should be aiming for, so that when the term comes up, even if a citizen doesn't know the particulars, they understand the rationale that the city um, has developed as long, for long-term policy and the use of, of tax increment or, or other kinds of economic initiatives um, like tax abatements. I mean, there's all kinds of things that are out there TIF is the one tool that uh, they routinely use, and it's probably the one that it, that transparency at the policy level, not at the particular level. That's for people like uh, Manila here, um, that um, um, that the public understands the policy, um, and then trusts the uh, local officials to make good decisions based on their discussion um, of the. Um, uh, of the program itself. Senator Rest, thank you so much. Thanks to our other panelists, John Manillo, Jay Kudrowski, Lee Kruger from the St. Paul Port Authority. Thanks to the audience for spending an evening talking about tax increment financing. Uh, there'll be a Q&A uh, for the folks here later. Um, I'm Curtis Gilbert. Thanks to our uh, sponsors at St. Paul Strong and our hosts at SPNN. Good evening. <laughs>